So I had something I was working on, but I couldn't finish it. So you're going to get a something different. And maybe next week I'll have the other thing finished. We'll see. Um, today is going to be uh, a title called Lord It Over, which we will find, obviously, in a scripture. Um, I'm sure you know where that is or have heard of it before. And we're going to kind of read about, uh, look, about, look at being what it means to be uh, lorded over or lorded over others. Um, so let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we're gathered here together today uh, to fellowship, um, to be with other people that um, have at least some things that we have uh, likeness in mind um, in you. And uh, hopefully, Lord, that we'll listen to things and learn things from each other um, that we're learning, uh, that we're reading, uh, and things that you've impressed upon our hearts um, in, in the ultimate goal that we would take those things and uh, try to work them into our lives as best we can to live for you uh, in your kingdom um, so that we might manifest uh, your glorious and great name uh, to those that we come in contact with every day. Amen. So today we're going to be talking about domination. And I shared a while ago with you, I started reading a man named Walter Wink uh, a while back. Um, and some of this is from some things he said about domination. And I think I mentioned it maybe in the past couple of weeks that I had been reading it and some of the things that he had to say about organizations uh, and redemption and that, which is interesting. But uh, the basic premise or basic topic he he talks about in some of his books is domination. Now, domination doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't have to be um, governments or bosses or anything like that. Anybody is capable of a dominating spirit, anybody, uh, in any type of situation. And so that's what we're going to look at today is what what does that mean? Um, kind of from his mind, and also some some things from the scriptures. So, to dominate, or a domination uh, system, or a dominating person, if you look up the, the definition of domination, um, it's supremacy or preeminence over another. That makes sense, right? You are over top of someone else, for whatever reason. Because you're better, smarter, kinder, more loving, more powerful. It could be anything. But because of that, you are supreme. Uh, exercise, the second one is exercise of mastery or ruling power. So that's a little different than the first one. Because this one is definitely somebody is in power or some people. Um, over somebody, and they rule, and they master over them. Uh, you know, one of the, as I was doing this, I thought, well, Jesus was called a master. Jesus, as a master, is a master in what? Teaching. It's not domination, right? So if you were uh, in some kind of oriental arts you know, sometimes they call the person my master. They're not the master because they're preeminently supreme and dominating. They're the master because they're the ones you're modeling yourself after and learning after. So mastery or ruling power is master as in I am it. There is nobody else. And the third one they had was exercise of preponderant, governing, or controlling influence. So even... If it's not direct mastery or preeminence or domination, it could be something that you're exerting from the back to try to get a certain pressure on people or ideas into people to get things happening. So you could do it many different ways. That is what the English term of domination is. Uh, and the first scripture I want to read from is Colossians Chapter 1 and verse 13, if you could turn over there. It 
the spirit of domination has existed since the beginning of time. And, in, you know, in different ways, in different settings, it's grown, it's gotten bigger, it's fallen, and others have taken its place. It's always been there. And Jesus sought to come and free people from domination um, of all kinds, all kinds. All right. So in Colossians 1.13, it says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Now, Paul, uh, and we'll read several things from Paul. He made it a point a couple times to say there are authorities, there are realms, there are uh, dominions that have had power over you. And Jesus Christ has come to free you from that. Now, usually we try to narrow down, oh, what are these powers, right? There's books about the powers that you can read, and, and they talk about uh, supernatural beings that were powers over people. Or some people will say, well, it's Satan was the domination that he was trying to free us from. Others I've read in commentaries say, well, this also includes the Roman government uh, and the Greek system of government that they were living, uh, trying to model after some of them. All of these things were dominating powers that Jesus Christ freed us from. And they're all, they all have truth behind them, right? Uh, all of them. I think also some of the domination that he freed them from was from the Jewish religion system that a lot of them were still underneath. That was a system of domination. And he transferred us into the kingdom of his son. God did transferred us into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. In that kingdom, which sounds completely backwards, there's no domination. Well, people will say, well, God's the king. Yeah, but God is not a dominating king. God rules over a kingdom of freedom from domination. And uh, it's up to us to accept and feel that, right? I mean, some people feel that God is dominating, that he's a dominator, he's a master, and I have to do this and that because he is who he is. Well, we need to do this or that because it's the right thing. It's because what he desires us to do because it's the right thing for all of us, uh, for our neighbors, for us, uh, for humanity. There's a way to live and a way not to live. So Paul is telling these folks in Colossae that they're free from a domination, a, a system of darkness. Uh, and for them, it could even be uh, the Gnosticism that was being bombarded on them. Uh, that Paul counters in Colossians. Uh, and so these are all the things that are putting down the people and keeping them in, I mean, you could even say in little boxes they put themselves in and, and they can't see freedom. So the domain of darkness is the same domain, and I'll say it as a domain of darkness is going to encompass all of these things. All of them together are a domain of darkness, and it's what we are to shine, which we talked about last week, so that others can also be drawn out of this darkness and into the freedom of Christ. Ultimately, the work of being called out is God's work, right? That's what Jesus says. In John 12, 32, it says that when he was lifted up, he would draw all men to himself. All men. All of humanity is being drawn out of these domination systems and darkness. Um, Jesus also said that men could come to him only by his father. So his father would bring them to him. He said that everything that was given to him by the father would not be lost. And you can read John 13.3 and John 6.39. They both talk about that. Everything the Father has given to me, I will lose nothing. And then he says later on, the Father has given everything to me. Everything is his. And Paul talks about that, right? He created everything. It was all created for him. 
and to him. It's his. He's not going to lose any of it. So while we are supposed to be shining lights, drawing people out, we should not think that when someone gets drawn out, oh, look what I did. We are something that we're a, a vessel that God works through to do this, right? And I'm sure God does it also in other ways, in people, just in themselves. But each person that is drawn out, it's their job to work with God to draw others out. So there is a spirit of domination which runs through the world that we physically live in. It is not that the spirit is some living being. The spirit of something. It runs through all of humanity. And it is a usurper spirit. Domination frequently happens, right? There's a domination, and another one comes up and plops that one down and puts themselves on top. Who were the first usurpers? Adam and Eve. They were the first ones, right? They were, there was a domination, a domineering spirit behind them, Eve saying, look, 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 God is dominating. You can be just like that. And so what did they do? They decided to be just like that. And that is part of the, domin the idea behind the domination spirit. It is a spirit based on the lie. The lie that we can be like God. Because when we decide to be like God, we're not like God. We pick up something that God doesn't have. And that's what this is, this dominating spirit. Because as soon as we decide we're like God, all of a sudden, we know everything. I'm the judge. Everybody else is terrible. I'm the best. I have control over everyone and what they do and myself. And nobody could be as good as me. And then we start to do things in that uh, vein. It is a spirit that turns human being against human being. It is a spirit that thrives on violence to obtain its own domination or dominion. It is a spirit that claims to be the one to fix all the problems, but quickly assumes clothing other than love. It's sinful, and it underlies everything in the world. The world not being the earth, the world being people. Right? We all live in some type of organized society, some type of system. We all work in something like that. We all belong to things that are like that. And many of them are great. But underneath all of them is that spirit. And all it takes is one person, a few people, a hundred people, a thousand people, 10,000 people, a hundred thousand people, and it just grows. And eventually, whatever was great about that system is suddenly not so great anymore. And then we don't want to see it. We want to see it go away. So does this spirit work in humanity as individuals? I said earlier, yes, it does. At one time, according to Paul, we all lived in that spirit as if it was the only way to really live for ourselves. Again, think of Adam and Eve. Think of Cain. Think of any of them and the things they did throughout what we read in the Old Testament or throughout human history. Being a believer in Christ does not absolve you from being suspect or susceptible to having a dominating spirit. It doesn't. Just because you're saved or you're a Christian doesn't like wipe this away. So when Paul says you've been freed from this and you've been transferred to something else, it's not like I just stepped into something else and all that stuff could never touch me again. It can. So turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll read verses 1 through 6.
Paul says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Many, I'm going to stop there for a second. Many people will read that and say, well, that's prince and power of the air, Satan. Maybe, maybe the prince and power of the air is the spirit of domination that runs through human beings that started way back with Adam and Eve, and it's just ruled, right? It's ruled the world. And it's working in the sons of disobedience. Who are the sons of disobedience? <laughs> we like to read that too and say, sons of disobedience. Well, he's talking about a certain group of people or somebody. He's not. Anybody who doesn't understand this and is not walking in the freedom of Christ in the kingdom is a son of disobedience. Among them too, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you were following this spirit, this prince, which is a domination term, right? A prince of the air flowing around the earth, however you want to imagine that happening, you know. You see, a, in my imagination, I see a, a city from the 1600s and all the serfs and people walking through the street and there's wispy smokes running through the air and it's going into some of their ears and their eyes pop open and they become does that sound stupid rose you're looking at me like it's stupid it's it's something that paul is talking about that's spiritual and how do you you know how do you think about it? what does it look like right uh all of us live there all of us can live there and he says formerly we lived in the lust of our flesh and you know often we think of lust of flesh as just being about everyday common sins that we think about. But lust of the flesh could also mean that, hey, there's a dominating spirit that I wanted to be part of and that I have been part of, and I've taken place in that, and it's a lust of the flesh. And as he says, indulging of the desires of the flesh and of the mind, which made us children of wrath. There is a reason that daily, momentary acts of thinking and meditating on the resurrection is very powerful for us, right? It's very powerful. And if we continue reading in Paul, we'll see that, verses 18 to 23 of chapter 1. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what the hope of his calling is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all the rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Christ fills all and all. Nothing exists, nothing walks, nothing lives, nothing breathes without him. Nothing. Paul wants our hearts to be enlightened, not one time, all the time, progressively, every day, in enlightening to what he's calling us for. And he says it's a greatness of his power, God's power, which has to do with resurrection. Jesus came to earth, and he took on the form of us. 
And he walked on the earth just like we did. He experienced the same things that we do. I'm talking about basic humanity because he experienced things in a different culture and time under a different uh, government than we do. But as far as basic human things, he experienced it. He was tempted with the idea of you are the son of God. You can dominate. You can have all these kingdoms. It could all be yours. All you have to do is bow down to me, right? And I'll give you all this. That's the dominating spirit. And Jesus was very successful in putting back that spirit and saying, no, I don't want anything to do with that, right? That's not what I'm here for. And I think he would say, that's not what any of us are here for. Any of us. That's not what we're here for. So the authority and the power and dominion isn't just about spiritual beings, which it might be that God's over. It's about the spirit that flows on this war in this world that causes people to want to have all that power and dominion over others. You know, I used to think that, uh, you know, I had this thought in my mind once years ago that in, in Genesis, you know, Satan was this little snake. It doesn't say how big the snake was. It was just a snake, right? I have snakes in my yard that are this big, and I have snakes in my yard. This Lisa would tell you I have snakes in my yard that are this big, but they're not. But by the revelation, it's a dragon. It's grown really huge, right? There's a picture in there. There's something wrong, and it's like a serpent, like a snake. And eventually, through all of human history, it's gotten bigger. And it's eventually destroyed. That is, in part, you could take it as a system of domination that just grew and grew and grew. And God in Christ made the means by which we can raise above it. That's the picture of the resurrection. He came, he lived in it. He defeated it. He said, no, I don't want any part of you. And then it killed him. And then he rose in freedom above it. That's what we're supposed to see in the resurrection every day, that we are above it. Paul talks about newness in life. That's what the newness in life is. When we raise up out of that and say, I don't want part of that. I am different. I am free. The spirit always motivates. It always has plausible reasons for what it does. But at the same time, it's always bucking against God and God's love. And it generally will at some point fly in the face of everything that our Savior and Jesus Christ taught and lived for us. Sometimes this spirit seems like it is the best way forward for people. Oh, yeah, this is the best way. Considering everything that's going on around us, this is it. And it might be for that moment, but it might not be. You know, uh, this just popped in my mind, but I thought about this a lot last week. We sang a song last week by Phil Wickham. Now I can't remember the name. I wish I did because I'm like, wow, that might become one of my favorite songs. He says, he says, you can do this to me, do that to me, but I am who I am in Christ or something along those lines. But then he says, you can murder me or kill me, then I'll go to heaven. And I think of, you know, I, I always think of Ben Kenobi, right? When Darth Vader, him, they're fighting, and he says, you can strike me down. I'll be more powerful than you can ever imagine, right? There's a little bit of truth in there somewhere, right? But anyways, after that song by Phil Wickham, I just was thinking, especially as I was driving home, I'm like, We're afraid of death. 
obviously. Nobody wants to die. But what's behind that phrase that he's saying? I am going to do the right thing for God and for Christ no matter what. And if it means my death, then so be it. It means my death. I did the right thing. I know what's waiting for me. That's what it's saying. And that's what we hate. And that's why I think we grab on to these things like the dominating spirit so easily because we say, oh, that's the best way forward. Because we're afraid of something else. So we jump on something we shouldn't jump on because of what we're afraid of. But I think what God is saying is, keep on the right path. I'm not guaranteeing you that you're going to get out of this in five days once that you've defeated everything else. What I'm saying is if you do the right thing and you send out this message of light and love by doing the right thing, no matter what happens to you, I have you. Whether it's here or it's there. By doing the right thing, you're shining that light out and others might say, wow, look what just happened. Look what they just did. Right? I'm not advocating that you go out and become a martyr today. I'm just saying things happen and we have to think about what it is that we're, we're doing ourselves or what we're signing on to. Uh, Paul says again in Colossians 1.13 that we've been rescued from this, rescued. And we're rescued not so that we could sink back. We're rescued so we can wield the power of Christ and of resurrection against the things of the world, against authorities and dominions and darkness. And again, that doesn't mean go become, uh, go out and do some insurrection. That's not what that means. Paul means you live in love and light according to God and Jesus Christ, and that in itself is going to be against those powers. Because they're not going to be able to get you to come with them. Or you yourself am not going to become that. Are not going to become that. Because you're going to understand if I do that, or I become that, or I do things like that, then I'm doing the wrong things. So in the kingdom, the spirit works, the spirit of domination works in every single system of the world. In the kingdom we've been transferred into, is altogether and entirely different from any of these. And it is opposite of the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. We cannot be in positions to lord it over others from within the kingdom of God. As soon as you are, then you are, and some people might say, well, you can't leave the kingdom of God. I think you can leave the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God isn't a physical place. It's not like I get in my car and drive across the border into Pennsylvania where the spirit of domination is and then come back to New York where the spirit of freedom is. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's here. That's where it is. I'm in the kingdom. I can know I'm in the kingdom because God has put me there, but I can still act like I'm not there. And so that's what he reminds us of. So turn over to Matthew chapter 20. We'll read verses 25 to 28. It's a very important passage. It says, But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. And why is he saying this? Because in the verses ahead, there was talk of who's going to be the best. I want to sit with you. Uh, and he, he discusses that. But then he's coming down, he's saying, it's not about that. It's not about who's sitting next to me, who's powerful or who's not powerful. He goes on to say, it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be the first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. It's amazing. Every time we think of... You know, if you're, uh, 
you think of, you know, in the medieval days, there was a king and people were always scheming if they had a place where they could do that, a position somewhere, to get closest to the king, to get their ideas heard by the king, to be the one that was, you know, in the graces of the king. And they would even do it at the detriment of other people so that they could be the ones. Because as soon as they got there, they thought, I'll have some of that power, I'll be thought of, and I'll be able to wield some of this power of the king. And then I can get the things done I want to get done, or I can get rid of this person or that person, or be in the king's ear and get him to do something that I'm looking for. And that's what people do. And Jesus is saying, it has nothing to do with any of that. My kingdom, God's kingdom. It has nothing to do with power of individuals over other individuals. Sitting at my side, which Paul says, we all are. None of us over top of another. We're all there. But Jesus is saying, just because one of you is with me here, doesn't mean that you're in some position where you can rule over the others. It's, it has nothing to do with that. It won't be like this among you, my followers and believers. You're not going to be like the Gentiles which was who at that time? The Romans. The Romans had the emperor. And then they had, I don't know all the ins and outs of the Roman Empire, but he had people under him, right? And governors to rule certain parts of the land. And they had certain amounts of centurions and legions under them who patrolled the streets. And they had spies and everything else to make sure that everybody was falling in line under everything. And so they were all positions of dominating uh, authority. And that's what he's using the example as. That's not us. As a believer, that's not you. If you want to be great, then you've got to be at the bottom. You know, it's, we don't like to think of this, but I don't think most people like to think of this as far as Christianity, but we like to think, well, God's a king. He's great. He's over everything. Well, he is. But what else is God? What did he do? He came on this earth, Emmanuel, God with us, to be like us and to, as Jesus has said, serve. I'm not here to rule. I'm here to serve. I'm here for you, not you for me. And anybody who wants to be like me, and like the Father, has to be a servant, not a ruler. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Paul talks in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, about what is our responsibility and our duty and our spiritual service to God. It's to be a living sacrifice. That's what Jesus did. He came to be a sacrifice. And so the life that we're expected to live in the kingdom of God is sacrificial, servitude. That is not the way that we perceive a kingdom to be, right? We perceive a kingdom to have a ruler and a bunch of rulers underneath them. And we do this and that and we serve. I mean, you hear regularly, even in our own country, right? Public servants. But most often, none of them act as servants. They act as public rulers. And why does that happen? Because of the spirit of domination. It's natural in human beings to go that way. It just happens. We could fault people for all kinds of stuff, but sometimes I think, when I look at them, I think, I mean, it's their fault, but it's almost like they just can't help it. It's just there. They need someone or something, which is God, and lights in the world to show them a different way so that they are really servants, right? Right? Self-sacrifice is the primary way of life in God's kingdom. There is room for nothing else. The prominent become the servants, not the rulers, authorities, and dominions. 
So we are freed from that. And some people might say, oh, I want nothing to do with you. You're freeing yourself from that so you could be a servant? What good is that? I want to be a servant. I want to be the best. I want to be the ruler, right? But I think the idea that we get more and more and more is that if we were all servants and acting like that, and we didn't need powers and authorities and dominions, the world would be a great place. Now, of course, some people say, well, that's utopia. That's never going to happen. Most likely, it's never going to happen. However, that's what we live. And maybe in our little part of the world, our little sphere of people that we have in contact with every day, we live like that. And we make, we help make things better. And we spread that. And we help make life better. You think about all the rules and laws, Mosaic law. And when God said to them one time, he said, all you have to do is do these things and your life will be great. And if you don't do them, your life will be terrible. That's it, right? So the sons of the disobedience are the ones, according to Paul, who do the opposite of that. They will lord things over others. They will be the masters while others serve them. It is how this spirit operates among people of the world. And I have a couple examples. And I'm not going to read through them all because we're getting close to the time and I am actually on time. So uh, what does this look like? There are some examples in the scripture, many examples in the scripture. But recently, uh, my dad has spoken about the woman caught in adultery in John 8, 1 through 11. Then you could read that again. But it says the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been called, caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, of, the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? And of course they were testing Jesus. But what were they being? They had the spirit of domination. They wanted to lord it over him. And they were lording it over a woman, not innocent in the sense of what she had done wrong, but just some person that they could find, that they knew who she, what she was, and they dragged her there in judgment, in domination, in the system they had, which was a dominating system, the Jewish religious system, and tried to control something. We're going to control her, and she's hopefully going to be stoned, but we're going to bring him to this guy because we know that this guy is going to be on the fence and not going to understand. We're not going to know what to do. And no matter what he does, we're going to catch him. And then we will be, we'll have him. Right. And then we could drag him in front of everybody and say what he's done. But Jesus says, you know what Jesus did? He stooped down and rolled on the ground. And eventually what did he do? He destroyed their authority in front of a guilty one, destroyed it. And each one left with their heads hung, with their power being taken away from them, just like that. And at the same time, he didn't lord it over her either. Jesus didn't, even though he could, he didn't. He just said, I don't condemn you. Just go and don't do this anymore. Right? Go and don't be an adulteress anymore. Who knows what else she would have done in life? I don't know. But it wasn't the point. These men were lords caught up under the influence of the spirit. They attempted to lord it over everybody that they could. And Jesus turns it around. Just like Paul says, these authorities and dominions have nothing over you because they have been defeated. Jesus is the man living free of the system. And he helps those who are stuck in the system. If you think about the Good Samaritan, it's the same thing. Somebody beat and robbed somebody. And a man who was in this system walks by on the other side because he can't have anything to do with him. But another man, a Samaritan who's hated by the other one also, stops and helps someone who he doesn't know. And not only does he help him, but he takes him to a hotel. He pays for all of his medical bills in his stay there. 
and tells the guy at the hotel when I come back, we'll pay up and settle in full. And, you know, hopefully this guy will be better. He did something against that system that said he should be left there. And that's what Jesus asked. Who did the right thing? And of course, they all said, well, the guy who helped him did the right thing. Even though in their minds, that's not what they would have done, right? So what is the spirit? I mean, we've already, I jumped way ahead and talked about this already. Many would say it was Satan or maybe some spiritual power or demons, fallen angels. Maybe it's every single evil, evil person that's ever lived. Maybe it's all of us. It has been in different men and women throughout history. Sometimes even at the same time around the world, but often at the same time around the world. It's a spirit. It's spiritual, not a living entity in and of itself. It's just an idea. It's a way of life that, you know, you could say, Paul says it as it's in the spirit of the air. I mean, our literal minds, we read the scripture so literally, we imagine some type of angelic being flying through the air, exerting rays of power on people. That's not what it is. It's a spirit. It's an ideology that we have that just is here. And we can either choose to be it or choose not to do it. But people get caught up in it every day and it spreads. In Matthew 27, again, we won't go there because we're going to stop here in a couple minutes, but uh, the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and put Jesus to death. So the crowds, many of the very crowds that claimed Jesus was going to be the king and laying palms as he rode into the city as a donkey, now all of a sudden, this domination power, the religious leaders get the people fired up, and the spirit spreads through them, and all of a sudden they all want the insurrectionist, Barabbas, to be released. And Pilate asked them, what should I do with Jesus, who was called Christ? And they said, crucify him. And he says, what has he done? And they keep shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. It's a mob. And that's what, that, that's what happens. And all of a sudden, they're all sucked up into this idea that probably many of them, I would gather... The most, the average common Jewish person who knew who Jesus was, if they had the chance and they were sick, would do everything they could to get to him to be healed because they've heard of all this. And they've seen all the wonderful things he does. He's fed people. He heals people. He's loving. He's kind. And all of a sudden, like that, they can be turned against him. That's the spirit at work. It's not Satan. It's not a demon. It's people. It's there, waiting for an opportunity to get us where, where we want to be. It's not even it. It just it's something that happens in us that drives us into doing something. It's not always boisterous or chaotic like that crowd in front of Pilate. It can be organized and amiable and appear kind and loving, but it has motives behind it. It can pull together and do things the right way for a while, but usually, eventually, it succumbs to the spirit and works against what was right. And it is virtually impossible to keep it at bay. Virtually. It's not impossible. You can keep it at bay a lot, but at some point, it's probably going to sink in. And one final scripture, Romans 8, 6 to 8. It says, For the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We talked about this years ago. Flesh. The Greek word there is Lisa's favorite word in the world. Because she would always say, why do you have to keep saying it? Sarks. <laughs> The sarks is the flesh. It's not this flesh. It's spiritual. It's a spirituality that is in us and works. He says, Paul says, on death. Right? 
but the mindset on the spirit on Jesus Christ, on the spirit of God is life and peace. It's servitude. It's self-sacrifice. That's what brings peace. And because that other is hostile toward God, it goes against everything that God says. It tries to set up its own domineering ways and authority and power, which is against God. Because as Jesus said, that's not for us to do. It can't please God. So the only way to please God is not to be that way, right? So I guess I'm just going to close right there. I really, I have a couple of things, but they don't really, they're already been said. So the, the idea of domination, according to this man I've read, Walter Wink, or I'm reading, is that it's a spirit that lives among people. And we just join on so easily, or we do it as individuals over others so easily. But it's not freedom. It's not what we were called for. Amen.